I can argue away the existence of God um, and the, the belief in the resurrection of the body and I can wonder about if death is the end but the one thing that I find unable to um, shake is this conviction that there are um, absolute right and wrongs, that there is um, goodness and evil. I guess if I were going to just give the sort of banner headline that I hold really is that I, I'm increasingly convinced that following Jesus it is the best way to live. Well, hello and welcome to today's video. If you enjoy the video, then why not like it and even subscribe to the channel? You'll get more great debates from Unbelievable. You can also find our podcast with the info with today's show and our newsletter as well, where you can find uh, great updates, regular updates from the show. You'll even send you a free ebook if you register. Today on the show, we're talking about bipolar, um, mental health, and whether Christianity can offer a better approach to therapy. James Mumford is a visiting fellow at the McDonald Centre at Christchurch, Oxford. He's the author of Vexed Ethics Beyond Political Tribes and recently wrote an article for The New Atlantis about his experience undergoing therapy at a clinic for bipolar and the difficulties he had with its sort of value neutral approach. And we're going to be talking about that on the show today. Roger Bretherton is a lecturer in psychology at the University of Lincoln and former chair of the British Association of Christians in Psychology. Uh, and so with Roger, we'll be discussing James's own story, issues around mental health and what Christian versus secular forms of therapy can offer. So Roger and James, welcome along to the show today. Um, perhaps um, we'll, we'll start with you, James, just to sort of sketch out sort of the story that, that sort of forms the core of this article, um, because many people may know you through your writing, through your books. Uh, you've been on the Unbelievable show in the past to, to do a discussion or two. But this was the first time when I saw you post this to your social media that I realised you'd had had your own obviously struggle with with mental health. Do you, want, do you want to tell us a little bit about the background to that? Yeah, sure. And, and I should say I wrote the piece when I was a fellow at um, um, at Christchurch, um, and now I'm no longer a current fellow, but. Um, um, I have had bipolar since 2011. It emerged in my early 20s. I had bipolar 2, which is the sort of less dramatic kind. I've always sort of coveted the, uh, the more exciting um, variety. <laughs> um, and, uh, but it's, it's been a, a huge struggle. Um, and um, I've been lucky enough to... Um, have been able to be in psychiatric hospital in terms of having my my care needs um, catered for um, and and that I do sort of begin by saying that is you know mm. that, that is an amazing resource and, and is a privilege and the one that I was at for many reasons we'll go into was very good um, that created a sort of tension which we'll come to um, but on this particular occasion um, I was uh, in in this in this hospital and and they they really had a sort of they tried to marry um the pharmacological and psychiatric treatment with um psychological uh provision and so they had therapy classes for those not not for all patients who weren't able to um you know be uh, you know sufficiently able to to participate in those kind of groups but they had group therapy they had lessons on um, cognitive behavioral therapy, all of which was um, was very helpful. Um, but there was one class which was this, which was uh, I, I found disorientating, um, and that was a class on um, acceptance and commitment therapy. I gathered after the fact, um, and in it, the psychologist began by writing the word values on the board. And I should say, you know, I used to teach moral philosophy at the University of Virginia. And so values and ethics is something that I was interested in, um, that I am interested in. Um, and I had been the teacher, but now I was the pupil because I was the patient. And so there was an interesting reversal that was going on. Um, and he began by saying, you know, what are some of our values? And then he gave a list, which was a very strange list. It was a list uh, which said things like just words on it, swimming, honesty, honor, courage. And it was a jo jumble of sort of hobbies and virtues. And his lesson plan was to get us to circle the particular values we identified with. And everyone circled different things and handed it back. 
Um, I think I circled honor. Um, and uh, he, he then immediately made the point that we, we, we each had different values. Um, and it went on from that to say that it's not just that we have different values, but we often dif disagree about our values. And that led him to conclude that even though morality was something externally imposed by society, values are subjective. Um, and this was this sort of dose of moral relativism, which, um, which I experienced. This, I felt that it wasn't just um, a case of a psychologist trying to be, uh, you know, have good liberal neutrality and not, you know, um, impose a morality, which is very important. But I think he was actually rather getting at, he was trying to say that values were constructed and so therefore um, sort of subscribing to or buying into or acquiescing in a subjectivist picture um, of morality rather than one where um, being a person is about vision, not choice, and what we see is goodness and objective goodness that's out there in the world and that makes certain things absolutely right and absolutely wrong. And so there was a, there was a philosophical commitment in this therapy, which just to finish made me, made me feel a lot worse than when I went into the um, particular class. It, mm. it made me, it made me feel that uh, if you know values are, are all things that we just construct and they can be deconstructed, that that I felt like I'd lost my moorings, lost my bearings. Um, because of this, um, this moral yeah. relativism or value subjectivism at the heart of what was being taught. I, it, it's, I mean, we'll, we'll come back to your story and it's told very well, as I say, in this article for New Atlantis and it's, it's available from your website as well there. Um, and we'll make sure to link to that. Um, before we hear more though of, of that experience, Roger, perhaps, uh, as the, you know, uh, psychologist in, in this conversation, do you want to give a sort of a definition of bipolar? Um, I'm sure it manifests in, in different ways. As James says, he, he didn't have the more extreme variety that perhaps, you know, uh, is more colorful, <laughs> you know, um, a rather boring variety. I think you, you know, d describe it as in your article, James, but, but what, what, how does bipolar manifest itself, Roger, in, in, in different people? Yes, yeah, so, so James is absolutely right in in terms of saying that, that there seems to be the, these sort of two versions of bipolar disorder, one of which seems to be very heritable, um, very extreme. Um, you almost have no choice over whether you have it or not, and that's the sort of type 1 variety that I think he, he covets it a, a little bit because it's sort of completely out of control. You know, any sense of you having any insight or responsibility for what's going on is completely out the window. Um, Whereas the type two kind of bipolar disorder um, it effectively involves the same kind of rapid cycling between mood states, really, from sort of very depressed states sometimes, sometimes up to a very sort of manic and, and hyperactive um, state. So if you imagine we had we have a sort of physiological window that we live in all the time, the bottom of which is sort of numbing depression, if you like, the top of which would be very, very extreme activity and sort of irritability and extreme hyper arousal. Then in bipolar disorder, what happens is someone yo-yos between the, those two ends of things. Um, and one of the ways of sort of talking perhaps about the type two version that James is talking about is, is perhaps imagine what it's like if you have a series of successes in life very, very quickly all in a row. And they, they sort of impact you in a very sort of activated, excited way. And you get more and more and more excited. It's like you're going up and up and up this spiral staircase. And then suddenly you hit some block or some dysfunction or something really hard. And, and you sort of drop all the way down, down to the bottom again. So one of the psychological ways of sort of making sense of type two bipolar disorder really is to view it as a, a sort of fault in what we call the behavioral activating system. And that, that's the part of us that approaches things that attract us and runs away from things that we find aversive or dislike. Um, I, and we have that, many other species have that, but what seems to happen um, in bipolar disorder is that we get stuck in one of those, approach, 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 higher and higher and higher energy, and then the opposite, withdraw, 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 lower and lower energy. And that's one of the things that kind of ends up with these sort of spikes of high emotion and then low energy as well. That's really helpful, thank you. James, what, what, what's been your experience, if you don't mind me asking, when it comes to bipolar? Is it is it that sort of, 
quite drastic swings between feelings of depression and elation what what what's exactly, in your yeah i, I mm. resonate with roger's description um i uh you know short-lived highs no psychosis um and then sort of crashing lows and so it's very interesting to hear roger put that in a, a species-wide definition yeah um and and when you were seeking help uh, you know you, you you were obviously recommended this particular type of therapy um are there other things that have you found helpful um in terms of helping to sort of manage that that bipolar yeah there's there's lots of strategies i've been very well served by by the health service um i think it's very important to um you know the the, the welcome destigmatization of the illness um, is worth mentioning and um, uh, I've talked to my GP and then the mental health trust and then the NHS that oversees the GP who I'm um, overseen by. Um, there's been different forms of therapy and we can talk about the differences between different forms of therapy. They haven't all been as uh, as unhelpful as, uh, as the one that I write about in the article. Um, but uh, cognitive behavioural therapy can be, um, I, I found helpful in terms of questioning my thought processes and, and how that relates. And then also not to, to forget the sort of pharmacological regime, which isn't everything, but it's definitely not nothing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's, it's very hard to, uh, um, to, to sort of, you know, recognise that, um, to have the counterfactual of how you'd be without it. Mm. But I, I, I do believe it's been the different medications I'm on, which I won't go into, but, um, you know, have, uh, you know, have, have been very yeah. um, beneficial. Yeah. Um, Roger, what's been your experience in terms of both your personal experience, maybe, uh, you know, as you've approached this at a personal level, but especially that stigmatization around it, do you feel it's going away? What does that look like? I know you've done some research in clergy as well in, in terms of their own mental health. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I sort of hold the view that it's very, very difficult for the stigma of mental health to go away, um, partly because um, there's elements of it that are so frightening for us. Um, so so we all have some element of mental of every mental health problem in us. You know, I've never seen a client where I haven't thought there, but for the great grace of God, go I really, you know, so you spend some time with someone who's anxious or someone who's depressed, someone who's paranoid, someone who's obsessive. And, and it sort of reveals those elements of your yourself. Um, and um, that's why I think it's very difficult for the stigma to go away, because in a sense, there is something inherently frightening about mental health problems in other people. I, and that's why I sort of ideologically end up, my view of psychology really is that psychology, when it's done well, humanizes some of the most complex behaviors, some of the most difficult emotions that people have, and, and therefore makes them understandable, makes us go, oh, I understand that person, they're, they're sort of alongside me in the human race now. I, and weirdly, as we do that, we not only have compassion for other people, but we also find ourselves accepting elements of ourselves as well. And certainly when it, in the research we've done um, with my team at Lincoln uh, on clergy mental health, for example, we find sometimes that, that what's happened is that either clergy felt under extreme pressure not to reveal any of those flaws or difficulties or seek help for them, that they somehow have to be this sort of ideal person. Um, or alternatively, uh, uh, one of our articles was named Jesus was crucified, so why shouldn't I be? Um, which is basically the idea that some clergy have this idea that this is just tough and it is hard and we should endure it. <laughs> That's kind of the way it was. So on one level, a kind of, I mustn't be imperfect, but on another level, the fact that this is so tough is kind of, this is just part of what it means to be a Christian, almost. Interesting. Um, James, how have you sort of, well, perhaps you'd want to, give us a, a sense of, of the way in which faith kind of plays into this for you because you talk about you know quite quite openly the fact that you've come from a christian background but that obviously the mental health issue sort of impacts how you've been able to approach your faith and so on um if i if you don't mind me reading a bit from from the article here you say i should confess at this point i was raised religious it was an informal but earnest strain of faith, neither dull nor rigid, intellectually open yet shaped by an expectation that God talks back. For 20 years I've wrestled with the faith I inherited, unable to shake the thought that just because I was brought up believing, it doesn't make it untrue. I was also brought up believing that 2 plus 2 equals 4. 
In the grip of depression, though, the intellectual edifice upon which I've built my life is shattered. A different vision crowds out the spiritual one of my youth, a vision eloquently espoused by the novelist Martin Amis in his memoir Experience. And you quote, the trouble with life is its amorphousness, its ridiculous fluidity. Look at it, thinly plotted, largely themeless, sentimental, in an ineluctably trite. The dialogue is poor or at least violently uneven. The twists are either predictable or sensationalist, and it's always the same beginning and the same ending. And you conclude this little part of the article, where once there was God, there is silence. Where once there was hope for the resurrection of the body, there is at death you break up the bits that were you start speeding away from each other forever with no one to see as philip larkin writes so this is obviously the the sense you know when you are in that that depressive state that that faith just seems to evaporate seems to not make sense um what, what how, yeah how what what do you do in those moments how how is how is how, where does that leave you as as you've sort of tried to struggle to reconcile obviously your your beliefs and and this this meant this this sort of the depression yeah. you obviously experience um yeah well i mean i think you know it's a, a symptom of depression is this kind of crisis of doubt or crisis of faith um and so seeing it as depression is is almost an achievement you know um being able to see that your lenses through which you're looking at the, the world have been um, darkened or coloured, and so that you're you're looking through um, lenses, and you may not you, you may you may not have a clear-eyed view of the case and of and of the reality of of um, of God. Um, so that that in itself is an achievement to get to that space. Um, I don't think that clergy who you know deal with Crisis, crisis. Obviously, it's a, it's a profession for them, but you know, who experience. I think that well, the danger I think is to say that you know these moments of doubt must mean that your faith is weak, um, rather than that your depression is strong. Um, and so, I think that's very important. Personally, um, I've I've turned to friends and friends who are Christians. Um, and who are religious and often sort of felt supported by their faith and obviously their prayers, but but also their conviction about what is the case in the world. That if I can get outside of my own sort of paralyzing viewpoint at that moment and rest on the conviction of family and friends, you know, who, who might have a clearer view, then that also is something that I found enormously helpful over the years of, of struggling with this illness. Um, um, and also, um, but what I write about in the article is this sort of almost sort of Cartesian in the sense of Descartes sort of stripping away everything and beginning again um, in terms of trying to construct a thought world that's plausible. And the thing that I can, I can argue myself in moments of depression extreme depression i can argue myself out of the existence i can argue away the existence of god um and the, the belief in the resurrection of the body and i can wonder about if death is the end but the one thing that i find unable to um shake is this conviction that there are um absolute right and wrongs that there is um goodness and evil um, and in some ways, that's a Kantian thought. Um, Kant sort of got to postulated um, a belief in God via a certainty about the moral law. But it's not so much an intellectual move um, as a sort of... A, 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 well, it, it, is, it is, I am talking about ideas and the building up of an intellectual framework. But it's just when you know that you know that you know that it can't be that there is no meaning, there are no absolutes, values are subjective, which is what I was taught in, in the hospital. Um, because you know that if that was true, then some of, the, some of the appalling things that we see in our world, we would have to say are just relatively wrong. They're only wrong from my perspective or from, but from the perspective of the per person who's perpetrating that murder or that abuse. Um, it might be justified. And I can never get to mm. accepting that thought. 
And so these moral certainties or convictions is where things bottom out for me in moments yeah. of extreme depression. Yeah, that, that's really helpful. And, and it brings us back to this, this point that, that James raised at the beginning there, Roger, that, that this particular kind of therapy that was being offered uh, in, in this retreat um, seemed to have at the core of it this kind of relativistic view of morality and so on. Um, I think um, you, there's a name for it. Is it ACT, um, the, the model of psychotherapy? Do you want to just explain what that act? Yeah, what that is act and 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 Roger, why why this apparently is is deemed to be an important aspect of it? The kind of the fact that you know, well, if we can't agree on moral values, then they must all be completely subjective. Yeah, yeah. Um, because um, it, so act or accept as a commitment therapy is part of uh, what some people call the third wave of cognitive behavior therapy, really. So you have sort of the first wave, you know, back in the 50s was sort of the behavioral wave. So that was when people were doing graded desensitization and treating phobias and things like that. And then the second wave arrived kind of <clears throat> In the 70s or 80s uh, with Aaron Beck and others where they added in cognition so how we thought was important as well as that and then what happened kind of in the 90s and onwards was, was they began to realize that that sort of cognitive behavior therapy which worked really well for about 60 percent of people who who received it but there was another sort of 40 percent who for whatever reason it just didn't touch their problems didn't work very well for them and so some people would say that the third wave came about through saying, yeah, we don't just need a, a psychology or a technology of change. You know, I'm, I'm thinking badly. How do I alter it? Or I'm behaving badly. How do I change that? We also need um, a, a, a technology of acceptance that sometimes we encounter things in life that are hard. They are tough. And it's really difficult to know exactly what we should do with them or how we should change them. So we sort of need a psychology of coping, a psychology of acceptance, um, a psychology of distress tolerance for a period of time. And so that, that, that's what the title is about. The, the title is, you know, accept what you can't change and then commit to, in this case, your values to try and change them. Now, I, I know what one of the things that sort of really interested me in terms of James's article, in terms of this conversation is until I read James's article, I would have it, literally I'd had a text from someone the week before saying, I've got a friend who's a Christian. They're having act therapy. Um, is this OK, you know, for a Christian to receive it? And I'd responded saying, well, from my point of view, act is one of the most compatible therapies with Christianity. And then it was reading James's article. I thought, now that's really interesting because it's quite a different way in which I view it. And what I realized at that point is that I have taken on some of the principles and the practices of ACT, but have never bought into this sort of radical subjectivity idea behind it. So I've sort of accepted what's good out of it, but haven't accepted that kind of wide thing. And not only that, I, I find it really surprising that any psychologist could accept that sort of wide subjectivity. I'm sure they wouldn't be that subjective if, you know, something kicked off in the room or if they had a professional issue where someone breached confidentiality or where um, a, a psychologist had, you know, a sexual relationship with their client. I'm sure all that subjectivity would very much go out the window and suddenly they'd be dealing with something that they viewed as very absolute. Um, so I thought it was a really interesting thing that, that James had been confronted with it in that way. And um, I could mm. see why it would be disorientated. So my, my initial view of James's experience is, this is somebody sort of overstating the case um, in the, like that sound, sound what it's it, they're interested in what is your subjective experience of these things we've written on the board which of them matter to you and that's a good place to begin but I think they're then overstating the case by then saying all values of which skiing and tennis and whatever appear to be values um, are equally important I, I'd be really really surprised if when push came to shove even the psychologists themselves believed that I'll be interested just to get what happened when you kind of sort of pushed back in, in these sessions in a moment, James. We're just going to go to a break and then we'll be back with you to, to tell us more about that story and, and, and open up this whole way in which, you know, whether the ACT Act um, form of therapy is, is compatible in a way with, with a view that actually, no, there really is meaning and purpose and good and right, good, right and wrong and so on in the world. Um, 
we're talking though about um my bipolar experience that's what we're talking uh, we're, we're titling this episode can christianity offer a better approach to therapy as uh, james mumford opens up about his own experience as he has recently in a in a recent article roger bretherton also with us uh, from the university of lincoln he's a lecturer in psychology there and we'll be back in just a moment's time is there a God is one of the most fundamental questions of life. How do we make sense of life is a close second. But combining those two questions and asking, do we need God to make sense of life is probably one of the most important things we can ever ask ourselves. I'm Justin Briley, and I'd like to introduce you to a new teaching course from Premier Unbelievable that opens up our most popular ever show on this very question. Are you saying that no one is really an atheist deep down? I didn't say no one was. Okay. I said that most of the people who claim to be atheists aren't. My response is, nothing matters. It's all empty and meaningless. This is how the world is. Get used to it. The first part of that is nihilistic and the second part isn't. So how do you reconcile those two things? Famed psychologist Jordan Peterson joined me to debate God, meaning and purpose with atheist psychologist Susan Blackmore in a conversation that's had a tremendous impact. As one viewer put it, Bro, I was an atheist 30 minutes ago, and now I'm clueless. Well, we're here to help you make sense of it. I'll be your guide, taking you into the depths of their conversation over seven learning modules as we uncover several key questions about God. What does it mean to believe in God? Memes, genes, and the case for God. Is Western morality and prosperity based on God? To whom are you grateful? The universe or God? Does our search for meaning point to God? Does literature and art point to God? And finally, can we make sense of life without God? Through questions and assignments to help you explore these themes, you can follow the course at a time and pace that suits you, as I offer my own analysis and commentary on this unique conversation. You'll also receive our accompanying ebook with the full show transcript and additional essays from leading thinkers on the Peterson and Blackmore Big Conversation. You can enrol on the course right now and be equipped to have confident conversations about the most important questions of God, life and meaning. Welcome back. We're talking about bipolar, mental health, uh, whether Christianity can offer a better approach to therapy than maybe secular approaches. Um, really interesting story in The New Atlantis uh, written by James Mumford. Um, about his own experience as someone who suffers with bipolar uh, and was part of a, a sort of talking therapy in, in a retreat but it, it, it very interesting sort of diagnosis of, of the sort of subjectivism uh, that was on display in this particular way of dealing with it um, in conversation with Roger Bretherton on the show today so so James did you sort of um, sort of talk or push back in any of these sessions with the therapist who was saying you know ultimately we've just got to accept that all our moralities are subjective and, and kind of once we accept that, then we can embrace our, I think he described it as core values, you know, that, that we just have to accept the things that are true for us and, and kind of you and, and so on. So what, what was your sort of response as, as that was kind of being put out there to, to this group of people? Yes. I mean, the thing that struck me at the time was that, um, and what I said in, in, in reaction to the psychologist who was teaching this, was that it seemed that their, the practice of this hospital, which is, a, as I've said, a very good hospital and a very compassionate and caring one, was at odds with um, what they were preaching in terms of this subjectivism about value. And that's because people like myself who go into um, psychiatric hospital with severe depressions or um, bipolar, you know, have, have have often, in my own experience, lost a sense of their own value and their own worth. And according to my own perspective and my own vantage point, my own value has fallen out of view for myself. And if value, what I said was, if value is subjective, then it would follow that the psychologists and the nurses and the psychiatrists and the whole mental health team would have to agree with me and would have to say, well, if that's how you see the case, then that must be the case because um, your your viewpoint is, is of paramount importance and can't be argued with um, your subjective experience. 
and they would have to offer assisted suicide if someone came in and said they did they felt their life was they were overwhelmed by the weight of their own worthlessness and they weren't able to to cope anymore but that's not evident clearly what happens in the psychiatric hospital instead they act as if you have value and objective worth um, and that you've lost sight of that for that you as the patient have lost sight of something that is the case um, for because of the nature of your illness and they treat you as someone of infinite worth of inestimable inestimable preciousness um, and someone who's worth fighting for and whose health is worth recovering and that all presupposes that values are not subjective and so there was this real dissonance, I felt, between theory and practice. And if they could preach what they practice, I think we'd all be a lot better off in this case. Now, his response was, was just a, a quip. He said, we can talk about post-structuralism if you want to, <laughs> which I found slightly dismissive. I was happy to talk about post-structuralism, but I, I, I felt that I'd taken too much time <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the session. Go ahead, Roger. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I find myself sort of furiously agreeing with James um, on this one, um, I, only in the sense that that's exactly the situation. So if I'm working with a depressed patient, for example, I, I'm working in a situation where I absolutely believe something about that person that they do not believe about themselves. Um, sometimes even right down to, you know, if we're talking about their hope for the future, they'll often be very hopeless and I will feel that my responsibility as the therapist in those moments is to hold that hope for them. Now, now the difficulty with it, uh, and I'd be interested to hear James's perspective on this, is that um, in my early career, I often got trapped in the situation of a depressed person would come in and say, uh, I'm worthless. And my instinct was to go, oh, no, you're not. And then they would say, oh, yes, I am. And then and then we get into this real sort of cut and thrust. And, and that's part of the difficulty with depression is that depression um, Sometimes you feel like you're sat in a room watching somebody burn and they won't let you put them out. Some some people have described it as depression is sadness that cannot be comforted. So that's where things get a little bit more complex because I'm I'm then sort of in the situation thinking, how what process do I take this person through whereby they recover their sense of worth without me having to argue with them about whether they're worthwhile or not? And interesting, this is one of the places where ACT actually has some really lovely analogies about it in the sense that it, one of the sort of parables in ACT is the idea that depression is a, is a monster that, that, that is in tug of war with you. And the more you pull against it, the stronger the monster gets. Uh, and the end result really is to drop the rope. Let's not fight about, oh, yes, I am worthy. Oh, no, I'm not worthy. Let, let's, let's leave that behind and let's move on to what matters to you. And that's where the sort of emphasis on values arrives, really. Go ahead, James. Yes, that's interesting that, um, that, um, that are you saying that, that there's an acceptance of, of, of depression that is, um, that is how an act therapist would respond? Is that what, you, is that what you're, what you're saying? Or is it about identifying, even in your depressed state, things that matter to you, like your children or the things that you've lost sight of, but actually are connected to? Is that, is that the point? Yeah. So, so I, I'm saying that there's a sort of, um, I, I'm saying really that um, as a therapist, you're sort of operating on two levels at the same time. So I'm holding a great belief in the value of my patient, but at the same time, recognizing that I can't force feed that to them. In fact, they'll be quite resistant to me trying to convince them of that. And therefore, yeah. I'm sort of accepting a sort of strategic delay around how do I take this person through a process that allows them to rediscover that. And that's why, um, although I think we should debate whether we call them values or not, that's why sometimes even sort of very mundane activities like pet ownership, stamp collecting, tennis, etc., can become ways into that person starting to see elements of life that seem to be valuable to them, seem to be good in some way, and using those sort of quite quite minor things, really, that if the person can almost accept uh, and maybe even experience a bit of enjoyment in some of those mundane activities you're beginning to be able to build a way back to valuing again that, that's sort of kind of what i'm getting at yeah and I, I i see the the importance of getting the right therapeutic strategy um you know from um you're sharing your expertise with us is is really helpful i mean i think there's a sort of larger um 
irony about, you know, a lot of the reasons for depression are existential. People um, in a culture more estranged from um, store sources of meaning and comfort like religion, um, you know, come, you know, are, are, are coming in feeling that all values are subjective and everything's just made up and the the world is normatively inert and there is no meaning and um and then that's their problem and the pharmacological regimes you know can't you know satisfy man's quest for meaning as victor frankl put it and then they come into a class like the one i went into and all of their fears are confirmed um, and they're told all the things that got them there in the first place in terms of there is no objective meaning, there are no values out there. And so I think at the level of, um, you know, the strategic approach of psychology, there's something kind of deeply ironic and something that backfires um, about the subjectivist strain in ACT as far as I encountered it. Yeah. I and I, I mean, that's the bit I agree with you on. And, and that's the bit that sort of surprises me, that sort of very, very strong push in the subjective direction. Um, the reason I think a, a psychologist ends up saying things like that, I think firstly, it's sort of, I mean, you know, you're, you're the ethicist, so you sort of know these things better than me. But I often think as a psychologist working in a pluralistic culture, I very much am in that, that sort of world that Alistair McIntyre describes where, you know, we've got all these fragments of ethical statements lying around, but nothing really to tie them together. And I think the way he put it is we're all playing different ethical games. So he says, you know, your lob across the net is responded to with knight to queen bishop three. You know, that, that seems to be the sort of way it works. Um, so, so I think what's going, sorry, Justin, are you, for that? I, I was, I, I was just going to leap in and, and just say, you know, it's really interesting to hear James say, you know, isn't isn't partly the the mental health crisis. Has it been exacerbated by a certain worldview, a kind of nihilistic sort of, well, there is no ultimate meaning. We just have to make up our own story kind of thing, because you do get interesting psychologists, you know, the Jordan Petersons, the John Vavakis who say saying quite similar things. We're in a meaning crisis and it's sort of been, you know, it's partly because we've lost a story to live by, you know, arguably the Christian story maybe once gave us that sort of sense of there's there's a purpose to live for nowadays you know we don't have that story it's gone away um, what is it being replaced with lots of different competing stories and so on um, and so to what extent do you though Roger see that that is actually a contributing factor to what a lot of people are acknowledging is a sort of mental health crisis do you think that there is a, an actual worldview issue there quite apart from I don't know some of the current you know difficulties of life you know the, the modern pressures and so on maybe uh changing family relationships do you think that the actual way we think about purpose and meaning is actually contributing to to you know the rise in depression among young people suicide among men and, and all of the other factors that we we know are, are out there at the moment yeah that's right I, I think all of those things come together so it's the complete real collapse of the cultural forms that give us a sense of what is meaningful, what is good, what our life should look like. Um, I, I think it, it, the thing that Jordan Peterson speaks to, I think quite well, is the collapse in any sense of what it means to be a man. What does it mean to be male? And that's why a lot of men are sort of attracted to him because they're sort of, here's someone who's kind of coming up with an idea of what this means, like what this means and how we can sort of use it, you know, what it means to be a man um, in the world that we live in. I, I think then alongside that, some of what James was, was talking about around sometimes when those meanings collapse um, in, in a church community, for example, other people can hold on to that for you. Other people can hold hope. Other people can have faith. So you can kind of sit with, even though I don't feel this right now, there are other people who do. And so I can sort of just rest on them a little bit for a while. Um, wh whereas actually the number of people I speak to now, particularly in the student world is sort of 18 to 20 year olds um very often don't have any sense of community don't don't have anyone they can turn to who would hold that that side of things for them um and consequently they're they're sort of informing themselves through whatever the algorithm of youtube happens to have directed them towards you know over the last few months that seems to be where they're getting things from so i i definitely have that sense that 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 sort of loss of a unifying narrative a sense of meaning 
for for a while, I, I think what most people did was they they constructed a life that was meaningful enough. So they took you know a bit of family and a bit of sport and a bit of philosophy and a bit of this and that and the other, and they sort of cobbled something together. But what I find now is even a skepticism around the very idea that life can even be meaningful, uh, and therefore sort of a collapse into whatever feels good, whatever seems to be the right way right now, that's what I'll pursue. So no sort of, as James describing, no sense that there's a sort of objective valence or an objective thing we can touch base on. But but in in your case, James, even though you did have that, you know, framework, if you like, it, it still wasn't enough to stop you obviously feeling the effects of depression and so on. So, so that at some level, there's still just presumably a sort of a, a physical component to this there's there's, there's the fact that you, perhaps you are more susceptible to, to to bipolar or whatever it may be james so so where where does the faith thing come in for you james on this is it is it something that you that has helped or was it ultimately kind of i i it didn't really make any difference to whether i was going to you know end up feeling depressed or not yeah that's a very good question yeah there is the sort of brute illness aspect of it and so i'm <clears throat> i'm not suggesting that um, all people, or in my own case, you know, the a collapse in meaning was is the only driver of the mental health epidemic or of discrete mental conditions like bipolar two. Um, so I was making a more uh, general point, but you're right. In my own case, you know, I, I I have I have that belief system, and yet it's not enough to. Um, see uh, see you through just like you know you might have um, a, a, you know a belief system breaking your leg you know it doesn't prevent you from breaking your leg um, at, to use a very crude analogy I mean I think in the new in, in the Old Testament there's a sort of interesting moment in 1 Kings 19 when Elijah seems to be very depressed and wants Yahweh to take his life away and the uh, um, Yahweh sends, God sends angels to provide food for him and sleep. Um, and there's something quite beautifully basic about that provision. Um, and so um, there is in, in that encounter, you know, not a sense that uh, uh, he needs to pray harder or go to church more or you know be more religious to, to find his way out of an illness mm, yeah roger i'm sure you've got sort of your own sort of uh yeah wisdom on that i mean you've been championing what christianity can offer you've you've done a great course called the character course you've you've obviously written extensively on this as well what what for you are the the right ways if it's not pray the depression away <laughs> which obviously for many people does not work um what what is the way in which christianity can offer solutions to mental health yeah I, I, and i think we have to be clear about that that um sort of struggling to have faith or hope or connect with other people is a symptom of pressure of depression not necessarily the cause of it and i think sometimes we reverse it in christian circles at times um but but i guess if i were going to just give the sort of banner headline that i hold really is that I, i'm increasingly convinced that following jesus is the best way to live it, particularly as we look at it in terms of the sermon on the mount so if you think about the kind of characteristics we are supposed to develop if you think about the way in which we are to connect with other people so it seems that positive relational connections are one of the most important things for our mental health almost above and beyond anything else now so there are some psychologists who are really saying that's the thing that really matters um, I think a, a prayerful practice is, is very important as well um, in in terms of giving us a sense of distance and a sense of help from our own sort of subjective states and some of the perspectives that we have um, on things. Um, I think belonging to a community um, gives us actually a, a sort of material basis almost of kind of people who help, uh, people who assist. You know, I, I know uh, people with quite severe psychiatric problems who've been kept out of hospital because they had people around them who could decorate for them, sort out their their social security payments, etc., and so on. Um, I, and I guess the main area I, I've worked on uh, myself um, over recent years is really looking at how the development of good character develops well-being. So particularly looking at things like how we develop hope, forgiveness, gratitude, love wisdom uh, and the list goes on and on and on but um 
but but I mean there there is firstly the church seems to have really really good implicit expertise in those kind of areas what it often doesn't realize is that there's actually an enormous amount of science behind how we develop those things and what they do for us and how they can insulate us when the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune come to our door really and so i think from my point of view there's all kinds of resources that the church holds um and that being a christian holds in it um, we could also talk about the stresses of it as well but but to begin with i think the church has this treasure house of age-old ways of dealing with life um, that sometimes we ignore. What do you think, James? Have you come across sort of, or is the church doing the, its job, as it were, of, of preparing people for the vicissitudes of life? Or, or, you know, have we sort of lost the wisdom that perhaps is actually implicit there in our tradition and in the Bible and so on? No, I agree. I really like what Roger just said, um, <clears throat> um, particularly sort of thinking about um different virtues like gratitude and forgiveness and things that are being picked up on by positive psychology for example um and looking at the scientific basis of um of how that cashes out um i i think that those are there are extraordinary resources for living and for good mental health um uh within 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 the church um I, I, I just think I just sort of would want to double down on what I was saying about, um, <clears throat> you know, in the, in the scriptures, it does it does seem as if when confronted with the brute fact of depression, you know, there are there are simple practical and this isn't to disagree, but there are sim simple practical physical th things to be done, like to sleep and to eat, which uh, which there's just such a uh, sort of generous humane um perspective that mm. we get in 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 one kings um as a as a response to elijah's wanting to die and not being able to cope what what have, what have been some of the things that have particularly worked for you on that level then james i mean is it literally just if i don't get my eight hours sleep i'm i'm more likely to to to, to you know be unhappy um do you find that prayer does help or do you really struggle with prayer you know because you know it, it's hard to talk to god when you're feeling disconnected or, or whatever yes well i think absolutely if i don't get eight hours sleep i think there's a lot of research into this but you know bipolar or jet lag can be a terrible time um uh so the sleep is of paramount importance um as i said before you know sometimes when i feel that i can't pray i'm relying on the prayers of others both them praying for me when i'm not there and then praying for me when we're together and that's been a huge huge source of comfort when people are sort of holding you up when you when you don't feel you can do it yourself so that points back to what roger was saying about the community of the church um and and how vital that can be in times of need um and also then trying to have the trying to believe going back to the subjectivist point trying to believe other people's view of your own worth when you don't see it yourself when you're in the grip of depression how how do you get that sense though if if you don't feel valuable if you feel worthless me just saying but Jesus died for you James you really are worthwhile it, does that make any difference at that moment how how does it cut through in a sense the depression that's sort of stopping you from feeling like that well i i i, I particularly like two corinthians and the ministry of comfort i read that passage sometimes when i feel very depressed um <clears throat> and i sort of feel that the you know inviting this isn't instead of doing all those other things like sleeping but you know inviting the the presence of the spirit um and having a pneumatology that encompasses um, being close to those, uh, a proximity of the spirit um, to to people who mourn or who are, are grieved or in crisis or in dep in depression. So I think there is there is a sort of I have I have found you know hugely beneficial that that turn to God and to, an opening to the spirit, which I think is you know vitally important. I don't think that because of the nature doesn't mean that you're you're it, it it always works because of you know what i've said about 
when your leg breaks, you know, it doesn't just get better immediately because you pray. But there mm. is something, but to push the disanalogy, you know, there is something about when you're trying to sort of get get bearings, get moorings in life, um, that 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 openness to the spirit or inviting the spirit to come and the ministry of comfort that is at the center of Jesus' ministry in the New Testament. I think it is a vital resource. The resource sounds reductive, yeah. but you know what I mean. Yeah, Roger. Uh, yeah, I very much agree with James on that that particular issue. Um, it may, mainly in the sense that one of the things that quite often comes along with a depressed state is is what some people call a nourishment barrier, which is that sort of inability to take good things out of your environment. You know, one of my clients described depression as sort of a bell jar falling around him, and nothing could get in. It just felt like he was cut off from the world. Um, and, and there's a number of ways in church I think we can we can provide that ministry of comfort. So when I think of depressed people who've been in my small group, for example, quite often just praying for them not to be depressed is quite painful for them because they feel it puts a lot of expectation on them. And, you know, if they're not smiling by the time we're done, somehow they've failed. Um, so, so more than once we've had people where we've said, well, why, you know, here's a cup of tea, go and sit in the other room and we'll just pray good things for you without you being here. And then because you don't know what you've prayed, you're under no pressure, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, and almost if you come back in smiling, we may not recognize you. So just make sure you look really miserable when you come back in so that we know you're still the same person. And there's a bit of humor <laughs> in it all. Um, the, the other thing I'll sometimes find myself saying to people as well is it's very difficult for you to believe when you're depressed, for example, that you're lovable. Um, and so sometimes I will say to people, what would it be like just to hold maybe for 10 seconds before you drop off to sleep at night? Just imagine that, that you were lovable and that God loved you and that Jesus had died for you. Hold that for 10 seconds. When it's gone, it's gone. Um, and then maybe next time for 20 seconds and maybe next time for 30 seconds. Uh, and although that sounds like very mild and sort of very, very small intervention, that can be quite an accomplishment. Um, so I really liked what you said earlier on, James, where you were saying even recognizing that you're in a depressed state is quite an accomplishment. You know, it already shows a sort of a level of awareness in you th that's beyond the depression. And one of the reasons for that is when we're very depressed, the sort of prefrontal lobe front of our brain usually goes dark, usually shuts down. So we feel as if we are our depression. We feel as if that's our identity. That's who we are. And the moment we start to recognize that I am, I am not depressed. I'm a person who is feeling depressed. That sort of very subtle shade uh, of difference means that actually parts of our brain are being activated. Um, and I think what, what the, um, what the church can do or what a community of believers or just a good community can do is hold that belief for the person so that when when they're ready to take that step it's there and that belief is held on their behalf mm. um re really helpful stuff very practical stuff as well and um, and by the way i did the character course um which you created roger with my house group and it was superb it really was and i think there was a very powerful moment actually i think it's when you advise people to think about the ironic blessing from the Old Testament. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. And and you ask people to kind of apply that to themselves, put themselves, you know, it, sort of as the person, as it were, being blessed. And and that that was just just doing that was a very powerful experience. Um, and I think, yeah, there's 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 ways obviously in to, to, to being able to. To, to, to kind of, I suppose, feel that sense of being loved, of being worth worth something and, and so on but um we'll, we'll come back to you, to you both in just a moment as we're going to a final break now and we'll we'll uh, we'll conclude this discussion on bipolar um depression mental health um what can christianity offer alongside the secular approaches that are often out there uh, james mumford and roger bretherton are my guests for more conversations between christians and skeptics subscribe to the unbelievable podcast and for more updates and bonus content, sign up to the Unbelievable Newsletter. Really interesting discussion on uh, depression, uh, bipolar, uh, mental health and so on. Can Christianity offer a better approach to therapy? We've been asking today. Um, Jamesmumford.co.uk for James's website. And there's a link there to this article for the New Atlantis that he wrote, uh, which really prompted us to, to put this show together today. Uh, Roger Bretherton, you can find uh, a link to his profile at the University of Lincoln from today's show as well. The character course is another good place to go for that. What's what's the um, the web address for the character course, Roger, if people want to get hold of that? 
It's uh, the character course dot com. Very difficult to remember. <laughs> there you go. I'll link to that as well from today's show. Um, James, coming back to, again, the story that, that prompted this conversation uh, of yours. Uh, I mean, in the end, you obviously felt that this particular way of thinking about therapy and so on wasn't, wasn't ultimately helpful. It was sort of self-defeating as far as you could see. Um, where, where do you kind of land in the article when it comes to sort of your, your advice, um, the, the, your sort of thoughts on the way actually we can help those who are trying to push through depression and anxiety and bipolar and so on? Well, I think that, um, you know, as, as Roger's been saying, I, um, I, I, I land by saying that there may be some elements of, of the life we are supposed to live that uh, we may not have connected to. They may not be part of our value set at the moment, but are waiting to be discovered out there. And that's a very different picture from, from just saying that values are subjective. And um, it may be, I use the example of where I've made mistakes in terms of ranking and prioritizing of values. And I've valued my career over my family at, at certain locatable moments in my life. And so realizing that, you know, there's no grid or uh, benchmark or yardstick where by which to to criticize my value my va that that um, mistake that um, poor ranking of values um, if if we don't have this picture of of this normative this thoroughly normative picture of of what life ought to be like um, and so readjusting our values and growing personally and transforming and converting and turning around all presupposes um that you know that there are there is an objective set of values to put it in one way or that um there is this normative picture of what it means to flourish as a human being and so that's really where i i land in the article mm -hmm. roger yeah and I, I think that's really interesting in the sense that, uh, from my point of view as a psychologist, that's very often what's missing from psychology. It is not a sense of what is it that we're supposed to be? What are we becoming? What are the kind of lives we are supposed to follow? Um, and even if you look at positive psychology, which is kind of my world as well, looking at how we develop character, um, I've literally just come back from the European Positive Psychology Conference and one of the things that was being debated there quite strongly was just this idea of um, is, is there a way of unifying all this stuff and putting it together in one place with some people debating no it's we are just a series of fragments as people we pursue all these little sort of smaller ends and that makes life meaningful enough and other people being very dissatisfied with that saying no there has to be some kind of central ideology some kind of central pursuit that makes life worth living and um i i guess as a christian i end up in in the position of really saying well holding two beliefs about everybody i meet really one of them is to say that that we are made in the image of god and there's something in us that is just patterned to move towards that and to generate love and hope and self-control and kindness and these kind of things are part of us but but at the same time we sort of hinder you know frustrate sabotage that that image within ourselves all the time and we're constantly in the the grip of that dialectic but but in some ways like james feeling that there is um a patterning to the world that there's some kind of way in which we are supposed to become and i guess ultimately i sort of summarize that that by saying we 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 ought to become like jesus he is the model he is the one that we aspire to be like because he's the one who somehow sums up all of those things that are good in human living hmm. any, any final thought from you james as we start to wind this up um <clears throat> yeah i mean the book that i'm currently writing is this is sort of the first chapter of and i'm i'm tracing the <clears throat> the way that the what CSO is called the poison of subjectivism affects different modalities in psychology from psychoanalysis and Freud's abandonment of conscience as, as any kind of reassuring sense of good and evil across to positive psychology's purely formal definition of uh, 
of character, which is, it sounds quite different from from um, Rogers' course, and uh, and so I do think that um, this is a real problem. I, I don't think that um, the psychologist I had was was just an an, uh, an outlier, but that there are fundamental there's a fundamental worldview um, in, in view here, um, and that uh, it, it's one that. Uh, you know, it, it is very damaging um, for those who, you know, are struggling with their mental health. And it's very damaging for us as a culture. Mm. Roger, final thought from you as well? Yeah. And as as I listen to me, to me and James, in some ways, we're saying the same thing, I think, in many respects. But my my thoughts are that ultimately, on some level, um, I, I because I'm a psychologist, I'm an experientialist, which means that somehow that goodness in life can be found in the act of living, that that's where we discover it. Um, and I think what most psychologists are skeptical about is, is whether there's anything to be found out there at all. You know, what, what we can do is create a life that's meaningful enough and that will do. Um, and I think if there's a fundamental critique of psychology and why ultimately psychology can't save us from the mental health crisis, there's more psychologists now than ever and that the mental health crisis keeps increasing. Um, it is because of that fundamental superficiality behind it that that it ultimately doesn't have an answer. It just has a series of techniques. Mm. And I think that um, I think that's right. That we um, we are very very close in that, Roger. I mean, I think that the sorts of therapy and psychology I would like to see develop more would be one that um, you know has has psychologists encouraging patients to um, search for values beyond themselves but but also doing that for themselves so you have um, that that that's where I sort of conclude in the piece and I, and I think that um, that's absolutely key that that the frame the the trans transcendent framework of, of values or um, the this idea of um, objective goodness is not ruled out from the start uh, methodologically by <clears throat> by therapeutic modalities, but isn't imposed upon people. But it's but people are encouraged to make that quest to find it for themselves. Mm. Well, thank you both for a really interesting conversation today. Again, I will link to the article that um, sparked this conversation by James and to his website as well. Um, do check out his books as well, including Vexed, Ethics Beyond Political Tribes. that came out a couple of years ago. So it's an excellent, well, it's more more relevant than ever in the times we're living in, sadly. Um, so, uh, and Roger, uh, I'll make sure to link to the character course that's been mentioned and, and your own academic page as well at the University of Lincoln. But uh, for now, thank you both so much for a really, really interesting and open conversation today. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. For more conversations between Christians and skeptics, subscribe to the Unbelievable podcast. And for more updates and bonus content, sign up to the Unbelievable newsletter.